Okay, so uh, so I'm going to tell you about some recent work of ours, uh, which I chose partly because it has a very vague uh, similarity to uh, 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 sand pile of of Deepak, although the as you'll see the 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 similarity is is very superficial, um, but it just uh, tilted my choice of of what to speak about. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is uh, some, it's actually some experimental work. It's actually something that was discovered in an experiment uh, that I was involved with, with my, uh, so, so Wasim Bakker is my colleague who has an ultra cold atom lab. Alan Morningstar was my theory student who suggested these experiments and he convinced uh, Bakker's students to try them. And and what we found, or what they found, was something different than what they were looking for. So it was, uh, uh, yeah. So, anyways, uh, so what uh, Wasim Barker's lab has, uh, or one of the things they have, is uh, is uh, uh, an ultra cold atom uh, quantum gas microscope in which they can put lithium six fermionic atoms in a two D optical lattice and make the Hamiltonian to be the uh, Fermi-Hubbard model. Um, and then uh, in this particular experiment, in addition to the optical lattice, uh, a large-scale tilt potential, just a uniform force, was added. So in that sense, it was like being put on a hill, a Fermi-Hubbard model put on a hill so that there's force downhill along the x direction. It was it was two dimensions. Um, okay, and what was uh, found was uh, a, 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 an interesting, at least I hope you'll find it interesting, new regime of infinite temperature subdiffusive transport in a band gas. Um, and I'll explain what all those words mean um, as we go along. Okay, so the optical lattice is a standing wave of laser light. Uh, so going in uh, a standing wave along the X direction, a standing wave along the Y direction to make a square optical lattice. And what I've drawn here is each well of the optical lattice is like a parabolic potential. Um, it's really in three dimensions, but- Maybe, uh, okay, maybe yeah. you can, your, your slides are not moving. My slides did not move. Oh dear. Uh, uh, David, I, I think maybe you. Uh, I'm just you unshare and share again. Yeah, stop I'm sharing and then maybe. Uh, I think last time did you share desktop or the file? Uh, I don't. Yeah, like Can I say. Share I'm, again. Share again. Share desktop. Uh, no, that didn't do it. So, so I have it open in Adobe. Actually, let me just share the desktop. First to the full screen, right? And then yeah. share. Yeah. Oh, no. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And, and now can you move Sorry. screen slides? Sorry about that. Let me... Okay. Uh, yeah. Works. yeah, now that's better. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. So now the cursor is different. Do you still see it? The cursor moving? Hello? So your cursor is moving, we can see it. Yeah, you can see it, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, so here I've just drawn four wells of the optical lattice, so those lines are the potentials. And to first approximation, an atom sitting in that well is in a harmonic oscillator eigenstate, and so there's the lowest energy state, which I've drawn here, and then the next ones are up. And there's a substantial, the, the, the potential is strong enough, there's a substantial gap between those, okay? And then when the lattice is very strong, uh, the tunneling between the wells is weak um, and we're in that regime. So, so now uh, we're in the regime where there is tunneling between the wells, it makes a band, but the bandwidth is small enough, so there still is a large gap between the lowest band and the next band up, right? And so we're in a regime of one band uh, Hubbard model where they just fill this lower band, okay? Um, 
like I said, okay, so there's fermionic, lithium-6 atoms, two hyperfine states, which we just call up and down, you know, that they, they have, they're not, well, let's just call them up and down. So it's like spin a half fermions. Um, they're cooled, so they occupy only the lowest band. We're near half filling. And the conditions will be kept so the atoms just stay in this lowest band. Um, so, so it's literally making a quantum lattice gas, which I'm calling a band gas. Um, okay. And now if it's as I drew here with no tilt potential, so it's flat, all wells are at the same uh, energy, uh, then you just use, you know, for single, single particle dynamics, you just use Bloch's theorem. It's just like electrons in a crystal. Um, and so, so you have a, first a Bruin zone, a dispersion relation, the usual uh, sinusoidal thing. Um, and then if, if you take the derivative of the energy with respect to the wave number, that's the uh, velocity up to a factor of h bar. Uh, so if we say look along the x direction here in momentum space, the velocity uh, behaves like this. So near zero momentum, it's like what we're used to. The velocity increases with increasing momentum. Um, but then if you go out near the edges of the Bruin zone, the velocity decreases with increasing momentum. And then there's these points near the edges in the corner on the edge and at the corners of the Bruin zone, where although you have non-zero momentum, you have zero velocity because the velocity is the derivative of the energy with respect to momentum and the and the energy has a maximum there um, so any place there's a maximum or a minimum or a saddle point of the dispersion relation we have zero velocity okay so it's a so it's a gas but it's got this unusual kinematics in that the momentum and the velocity are related in this uh, uh, way you get from the block dispersion relation okay Okay, so so we so we have this dispersion, and now we're going to add a uh, a uniform force along the x direction. So now our potential is this optical lattice potential, which is quite strong, and then we add to it a weaker and on very much larger scales than the lattice spacing. Um, this just uniform tilt, right? And so this is sort of putting it on a slope. <laughs> a little a, a little bit like Deepak's sand pile, but it's not a sand pile. It's not a dissipative system. We're talking about a, a closed system with Hamiltonian dynamics. It's undergoing unitary time evolution um, as an isolated system. Okay. Now, if the if this force is not too large, we can just talk about the still single particle dynamics, talk about the semi-classical dynamics of a single atom, you know, before we put in the interactions. Um, and I've just added a force along the X direction. So the Y component of the momentum is still conserved. Um, and then we don't have F equals MA, but we have F equals DPD, uh, DX, DT, D, sorry. The force determines the time derivative of the momentum. That's the aspect of uh, classical dynamics which survives in this context um, and so that's just the force is equal to the time derivative of this wave number k sub x and that's a simple thing to solve um, but because you know because we're in a first Bruin zone I didn't say that here the momentum is only defined modulo 2 pi over the lattice spacing right so the momentum grows linearly in time, driven by the force, but it's only modulo Planck's constant over the lattice constant. Constant. So that's Planck's constant without a, without a bar there. Um, and so that means the single particle dynamics is that the particle will just move steadily in the Bruin zone, and when it gets to the this edge, it's equivalent to this edge, and so it's just winding around the Bruin zone like a particle going around a circle because the Bruin zone really is a circle. The two edges of it are the same point. Um, so it's a very simple single particle dynamics. Um, the atom is steadily winding around the first Bruin zone. It's periodic, so that's an oscillation. And then because of that, uh, the velocity is oscillating. The average velocity in this oscillation is zero. So the position is also oscillating. 
And a way to look at that is here's the energy of the atom, here's the X coordinate, and at this energy is this band we're in. There's a gap above the band, there's an X band up there. And then the particle is just doing a semi-classical oscillation back and forth between two turning points uh, in this band. The, the, the left turning point is what you'd expect at zero momentum, you have zero velocity, that's the standard turning point. Uh, but in a band, there's another turning point, which in this case would be the highest momentum getting to the Bruin zone edge, where the momentum gets its largest magnitude, Planck's constant over, uh, should be 2a, sorry, there should be a two, right, whoops. Uh, there should be plus or minus h over 2a, sorry about that. Uh, but at that point, the x component of the velocity is zero, and it's also a turning point. And this is what's called Bloch oscillations. So the, 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 the atom is just visiting all k sub x in the Bruin zone under this constant force, uh, but that results in a spatial oscillation. And if we keep, as I said, if we keep the force low enough, in order to go to the next band, it has to tunnel through this big gap way over to somewhere over here off the picture. The second band comes down to the same energy as what we're talking about here. And so that if we keep the F low enough, that tunneling process is uh, negligible. And that's the situation in the experiments we were looking at. So any, any questions about that uh, single particle, semi-classical picture of this uh, one band question. dynamic with block oscillations? Any question? Not yeah, so, 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 so now we're gonna add interactions. Um, it's, so this is now the Hubbard model. So we have the hopping, which I'll call J nearest neighbor hopping in a square lattice. There's a spin, sigma, which is plus or minus one. Um, so, so when it hops, there's no, well, the spin never changes in this dynamic. So the spin is conserved and we equally populate each spin state. So the spin isn't really playing a role. Um, on when two particles, they're fermions, when two particles of opposite spin occupy the same site, which is a well of the optical lattice, there's a repulsive interaction, which they can tune in the lab. And that's, we just tune that to of order the bandwidth of the hopping. So, so that's sort of the same order. So there's no extra parameter. You know, that's a tunable parameter, but we didn't really play with it very much. So, so, so just view that as uh, something of order J. Um, and then we put this tilt potential, which couples to both spins equally. It's just a force coupling to the for a given lattice site J, it has an X position. Um, and then this N is the, is, you know, N is just the occupation of that site. So the J is a site index um, and N is the occupation. Um, and then the, the force was varied from no force. So no tilt at all. And, and the highest tilt that was explored in this paper was again of order J. Um, David, can I just interrupt? Yeah. Can I just ask a question? I mean, I didn't understand yeah, what is what is X of J is X so, so the lattice J just index a lattice site on a 2D yes. square lattice. Right. And then okay. X is its X position. X position. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so I could have said X and Y labeled it with X and Y, but uh, yeah. So, so the force is only along the X direction. There are also, you know, the lattice is extended along the Y direction um, and there's no force in that direction. That's, that's the way it was done. Okay, now let me just uh, talk about, you know, a simple situation. So let's, let's first start with the gas spatially uniform and, and no force. And under those circumstances, they know how to cool it down to low temperatures into this band. And so let's cool it into this band and make it cold in that band. And cold in this context means low entropy. And if there's no tilt, that's an equilibrium situation, okay? But if we think about it, if we restrict ourselves just to this band, there's actually two different regimes of cold, one of which is the usual one, which is positive temperature, where we fill 
the low, so this is now, here's the energy, and we fill the states in the bottom of the band more than we fill the states in the bottom, in the top of the band. And that's the usual cold. Um, just, you know, put, put the atoms in lower energy states and not in higher energy states. But in this circumstance here, in this closed system, once we restrict to the band, there's another cold, which is negative temperature cold. Um, which means fill the states in the top of the band more than you fill the states in the bottom of the band. And in the absence of the tilt, this is also an equilibrium within that band, which is an inverted population, which is negative temperature. Okay. So, and in the absence of tilt, these are both equilibrium, right? Different equilibriums, one, and they both have low entropy. Okay. Now let's add the tilt potential. So the tilt potential is imposed by another laser and they can just, it's not a standing wave, so it uh, they can just turn it on and off um, on time scales short compared to the dynamics of the system. And now the system is no longer in equilibrium and the gas will thermalize. So this, this potential, uh, this interaction here, you know, the two dimensional Fermi Hubbard model is non-integrable and it'll go to equilibrium, it thermalizes. Um, and what does that mean? It'll just locally maximize its entropy given the local energy and atom density. It just goes to local equilibrium and it'll do that reasonably quickly. And then later I'll talk about what if it's uh, out of equilibrium on a larger length scale, what is the transport? But let's, right now, I'm just talking about going to local equilibrium. Now, it, in this case of a uniform gas, if it's at positive temperature, it does what you would expect. It just falls down the hill, slides, you know, we put it on a hill and of course it starts sliding down the hill as you'd expect. Um, and and uh, it's a closed system, energy is conserved. So the potential energy is turned into kinetic energy and the system warms up until it gets to infinite temperature in the band. So all the states in the band are equally likely to be occupied and that's infinite temperature. That's the maximum entropy it can get to. And it, so it only slides down the hill that far until enough potential energy is turned into kinetic energy to heat it up to infinite temperature. Now, the, the sort of less intuitive thing is if you start in this negative temperature situation that I described before. David, David there's, a, there's a question here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I mean, so what do you do at the boundaries? Is this is the thermalization before the, you see the boundaries? Is that okay? So in 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 reality, the atom is right, there, right. So in the real experiment, there's not only the tilt potential and the optical lattice, but there's also a large scale harmonic potential. So that uh, you know, when I say I start with the uniform gas, what I mean is I start it in a harmonic potential with whatever density distribution that gives at equilibrium. And then I add the tilt potential and what happens is, so you'd think with a harmonic potential and a tilt potential, it would slide all the way down to the new minimum of the potential, right? But that's not what it does. It just falls, you know, it, under the circumstances we're talking about, it just falls down the uh, hill by of order one lattice constant and that's enough to heat it up to infinite temperature. And that's as far as it slides, even though that's not the minimum of the potential anymore, right? So, but as far as the physics is concerned, you know, the, in the lab, of course, they have to have a harmonic potential and a finite size system. But as far as the physics are concerned, I'm talking about, we're talking about things on length scale small compared to the cloud. So we can ignore the boundary conditions. Um, I, I, I hope you're comfortable with that. Is, uh, yeah, is that yeah, sound okay. reasonable? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, when I say falls down the hill, it's falling down the hill in the experiment about one lattice constant, right? Because, because the forces are of order the bandwidth. So in order to heat this up to infinite temperature, it just has to go one or two lattice constants, right? Um, and so, and that's, and that's why the boundary conditions on it really aren't playing an important role. Um, but you're, but you're absolutely right. You know, there's got to be something at the boundaries. Um, and, and it's, it's just you know, on a bigger, much bigger length scale, it's confined. It's a cloud of gas confined in a harmonic trap. Um, but by putting this tilt, we move the minimum of the harmonic trap by a lot. 
and the gas only moves a little bit, right? Because once it's at infinite temperature, it doesn't care about the health, right? It's not, it's trying to maximize its entropy. It's not trying to minimize its energy, right? Closed, closed systems don't try to minimize their energy. Energy is conserved. They try to maximize their entropy. Um, Right. Okay. So, and the, the the less intuitive thing, and that's more illustrating the point we're discussing right now, is if you start with this inverted population where you're at negative temperature, what happens is the gas falls up the hill, converts the kinetic energy, which it has. The reason it's at negative temperature is it had more kinetic energy than infinite temperature has. And, and so it falls up the hill and converts that kinetic energy to potential energy bringing the kinetic energy down to what it would be at infinite temperature. And therefore, by falling down the hill, it heats up to beta equals zero, beta being the inverse temperature, right? And so, so that's some sort of counterintuitive uh, or you know, less familiar negative temperature dynamics, which plays an important role in, in what I'm going to be telling you today. Um, and that's what makes it interesting is, is all this negative temperature dynamics that's around, okay? So in both cases, the inverse temperature relaxes to beta equals zero, which is, inf which is infinite temperature or maximum entropy. That's all it's doing. It's relaxing to the highest entropy. And as I'll show you later, it relaxes at a rate that goes as the force squared. Um, and I'll get the coefficients in there as well. Um, okay, so, so now let's consider non-uniform density. And, and non-infinite temperature. So now we, so we've got the force on. We're not at infinite temperature now, but we're at high temperature. Um, and it's allow for non-uniform density. So if we're at positive temperature and we're at equilibrium, that means positive temperature means more atoms at lower potential energy, fewer atoms at higher potential energy. And so the density, so N, N now is going to be atoms per site. Um, and here's the forces going towards the right. So over here is downhill, over here is uphill, and the density will have a gradient to higher density at lower potential energies because we're at positive temperature. And so you get it in the high temperature limit, the uh, derivative of the density is just beta times the force. Um, there's an order one coefficient there. Um, but I'm not going to worry about order one coefficient that are just pure numbers uh, in this talk. Um, but we can calculate it because this is all at near infinite temperature for all the equilibrium stuff, even though it's a strongly interacting system, we can just do the high temperature expansion. So we know all the thermodynamics exactly near infinite temperature. We don't know the dynamics. We can't calculate the dynamics in detail, uh, but we, we, we can calculate all the uh, equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, okay, so, so that's what happens when it's at positive temperature, and if it's at negative temperature, at negative temperature, there will be more atoms uphill and fewer atoms downhill, because negative temperature means you're occupying high energy states more than low energy states, um, and this equation is still the same, still valid, it's just the derivative is now negative because beta is negative. And in the experiment, this is a quantum gas microscope, they can image this density. That's basically what they do, is they look at the density of the gas, and they can do that as a function of position. Um, and so uh, from these images, uh, you can measure the temperature. You know, the coefficient in here we know exactly. And so by taking a picture of the cloud, uh, the local equilibrium temperature uh, can be measured, um, even if it's inhomogeneous over the cloud. As, as I'll say uh, in the, on the next slide. Okay, so, so, so because of this situation here, uh, we have a thermometer. It's actually in, in uh, these ultra cold atom experiments, having a thermometer and knowing what temperature your atoms are at, it's not often the situation. It's, it's, it's you know, sometimes a challenge, but in this circumstance here, uh, the thermometer is, is quite straightforward. Um, near infinite temperature, which is which is where, where we end up in, in this experiment for the reasons I told you. Okay, so now I'm getting to the, you know, the heart of, of uh, what this experiment did. Um, 
so so in so now let's start with a sinusoidal density pattern right and so now so they can prepare this so basically what you do is you set the force to zero um, and then you impose the optical lattice which has you know a period uh, you know a period the lattice constant a and then you also impose a longer wavelength potential and let it equilibrate in that potential and it will at, at positive temperature, and it will equilibrate to some density profile, and they can pick whatever density profile, whatever wavelength they want, um, because they have devices uh, basically like the uh, projector that's probably being used to project these slides. They have a projector like that, which is very good, which they project into their microscope and put whatever pattern of light they want in and make whatever potential they want. Um, as long as it's at length scales, you know, a few lattice spacings, um, they can do that. Okay, so now it's equilibrated to some average density, which I said is near half filling, and then some sinusoidal profile with wave number Q. Um, and we make the Q, the Q can be tuned, um, and it has some amplitude delta N. Okay, so, 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 so you have this, and then which can be prepared. And then you turn on the tilt potential, and what happens? The question: How does it relax? Okay. Um, and it it will relax to infinite temperature, uniform density. And in order to do that, it's got to do transport of these atoms. It's got to transport heat. Okay. So, but first, what it does is it goes to local equilibrium, and and then you can take a picture and read off the temperature profile right and and since since uh the the beta the inverse temperature is just the derivative then the temperature profile is also sinusoidal so i just took the derivative of this and q over f delta m cosine qx is the temperature profile so here in this quarter i mean half wavelength of the profile there's more atoms downhill and fewer atoms uphill. So this is the positive temperature regime. And then over here, it's at negative temperature, right? And here it's at positive temperature. So you, so, so you have these, it's at local equilibrium, but you have temperature gradients. So heat will flow. And so these arrows I've drawn here are the heat flow. Now remember, negative temperature is above infinite temperature. So, neg so heat flows from negative temperature, which is actually higher energy, to positive temperature, which is lower energy, right? Um, so that, that's just the conventions on defining temperature and defining beta, that the, uh, the energy density is proportional to minus beta. Um, if, if we set the zero of energy, as I will, at whatever the energy density is at infinite temperature, okay? So now I'm just going to give you an, uh, a, a simple idea of why there's subdiffusive transport here. So let's now look in this half wavelength of this pattern um, and, and see what's... So this is where it's negative temperature, and there's more atoms up the hill than down the hill, right? And so there's some relative to the, what it's going to equilibrate to, there's some excess tilt potential energy stored. All... Uh, a, a quarter wavelengths worth of atoms that would be down here at equilibrium are actually up here, higher up the hill um, in this situation here. And if you actually just count the total energy involved there, uh, it's a number of atoms proportional to the wavelength, and that's one over Q. The wavelength is proportional to one over Q, right? Because Q is the wave number. And they're moved up the hill by a quarter of a wavelength relative to equilibrium. So, so you get this one over Q squared in the total energy stored, potential energy stored in this pattern, right? And there's the force. So the, the number of atoms is the number of atoms involved is delta N over Q times A. And the distance they're moved up the hill, or the energy by which they're moved, the distance they're moved up the hill is one over Q. And then the force is F, right? And so you end up with this F over Q squared uh, energy stored, potential energy stored. Now, it's also at negative temperature and therefore at higher energy 
compared to the infinite temperature. So that's the excess non-tilt heat energy. So when I say heat energy, what I, I'm just dividing the energy into the potential energy from the tilt and the rest of the energy, which I'm calling heat, right? And when we define the local temperature, we're talking about the heat energy, right? And so the heat energy stored now, the, 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 you need an energy scale comes in here, which is the, the hopping matrix element comes in. Um, but anyways, the, the uh, right, the, at long wavelength, this gradient is small. So beta is small. So beta is of order Q. And so therefore, even though this interval is a full wavelength long, so you would think there'd be a lot of heat energy stored there, the temperature is low, and so Q drops out, right? And so the amount of uh, heat energy stored in this half wavelength is, uh, doesn't depend on Q. It depends, of course, on the amplitude of what you've done, uh, but it doesn't depend on Q. And so therefore, when we have a long wavelength pattern like this, almost all the energy stored in it is potential energy, and it's not heat energy. Right, but the way this pattern dissipates is by heat transport. Right, it's at local equilibrium as far as the uh, density pattern is concerned, but there are temperature gradients, and the way it relaxes is by transporting the heat. But the heat is uh, the heat transport is only driven by this part, and we've got all this potential energy which has to be converted to heat and then transported in order to dissipate the pattern. And so this two extra powers of the wavelength, which are up here, uh, is what causes the dynamics to be subdiffusive. I'll go through the math of this more, more uh, formally on the next slide, but I just wanted to describe the, you know, the physics of it more in words. So you have slow heat transport that needs to move this much larger stored potential energy. So that there's a lot of potential energy being stored, but it has to be transported through a channel which isn't very effective at carrying it. And that's and so you end up with subdiffusive transport. Um, and so now I'm going to write down the equations for that. Uh, so more systematically. Um, so I hope I can you can you it, tell me when I uh, you know get to like five minutes left, so I don't... Uh... Actually, but you started a little bit late, late, so you have 10 minutes, basically. Okay, thank you. All right, that, that's the, I'm close to the end. Okay, so so now I'm gonna go through this hydrodynamics. It's just it's just diffusive trans, or diffusive and subdiffusive transport. Um, so we have, oops, so we have N atoms per site. We have the atom current, which I call J sub N. Everything's uniform along Y, but we're non-uniform along X. Um, we have the non-tilt energy, which I'm calling the heat energy. So I put a little twiddle on it. So that's the energy density. That's not the tilt potential energy, all the rest of the energy. Um, and then there's a current of that, right? And then the temperature is related to, the, I forgot to put the twiddle here. The temperature is related to the, uh, energy density by this, and there's a minus sign, right? Remember, negative temperature is higher energy, okay? And so now here's the atom transport. This is just diffusion. Dif so this is the atom diffusivity. Uh, whoops, so there's a typo there. That's uh, should be dn dx, sorry. So, so this is the usual diffusion. It should be dn dx. There's a typo there, which is fixed later. Um, sorry about that. Um, and because of the tilt, the gradient of the density should be equal to the minus the force times the energy over J squared. That's what I showed you before. And the transport of the particles, the usual diffusion transport, is due to the deviation of the gradient of the density from local equilibrium. And that's what's inside these parentheses is the deviation of the density gradient from local equilibrium. If you're at local equilibrium, it's equilibrium, and so there's no transport, right? And so, of course, it's the deviation which drives the transport. You know, the usual diffusion equation, this F isn't there, and, and that's the usual thing. And then we just have the continuity equation here, conservation of atom number. And so, so there's the usual diffusion. 
but we get this additional term in the diffusion, in the continuity equation, which involves the gradient of the energy density, okay? And now here, the, the, the uh, heat diffusion is just standard energy transport um, that the uh, energy current is proportional to the energy diffusivity times the gradient to the energy density. Um, but now we have atoms sliding down a hill. So if the number current is non-zero, that's atoms either sliding down or up the hill. And when that happens, the potential energy gets converted to, to uh, heat energy. So this system is strongly scattering, it's dissipative. And so whenever atoms move up or down the hill, that potential energy gets converted to heat, right? And, and that's what this is. So, so there's just a, in the time derivative of the heat energy density, there's just a term proportional to the force times the atom current. And that's just potential energy being converted to heat energy, right? And so that's here in uh, this equation, and then substituting this in, we have the usual heat diffusion, but then this current is given by this, and so we end up with these additional terms here in the uh, energy dynamics, right? And so this is the, so you end up with this, the, so, so you see all these terms with F in it. So the F basically strongly couples the atom and the heat transport in this way I've shown here, right? So it's both, in uh, this equation here, because local equilibrium has a gradient. Um, and so the atom diffusion has this additional term. And then this term here, which is when atoms move, they move up or down the hill, they convert potential energy to heat energy, and that also comes in. Okay, so these, are, these, these two equations here are the equations of the dynamics here. They're linear equations, two fields, uh, atom density and uh, energy density, heat energy density. It's a linear equation, so we just solve it by the standard methods. Um, the solutions are damped plane waves, e to the iqx, and then uh, they damp, okay? So I just substitute these in, and those equations become this um, for these amplitudes n and e twiddle, um, you, you know, so you know, if you look back here, you see the N equations got these two terms, the E equations got these three terms, right? And that's just here. So take my word for it, I've done the math correctly. The, here's the gradient terms with IQ, the gradient squared. So, so the usual diffusion is just the first term here. You see you set F equals zero, this is just diffusion of atom number, diffusion of heat, right? But then we add these additional couplings which involve gradient terms with IQs, and then this other term, which doesn't even have a gradient. So we have two modes and the relaxation rates are just the eigenvalues. So we just write this out as a matrix, N and E twiddle, here's the, the matrix. Um, and we just find the eigenvalues of that. So, it, and then the, if the tilt is small compared to the hopping times the wave number, or if the wave number is large compared to the tilt in that way, this is the weak tilt regime, which you can get into either by going to small force or by going to high wave number, short wavelengths, then it's just standard diffusion in this limit because the F is just a small correction to this. So that's just standard diffusion. There's two diffusions of, of particle number and energy. But if we go to the other regime, which is the novel regime, you solve this equation. I'm not going to go through the math of that, but uh, you get uh, the fast mode, which I talked about, which is just the atoms moving up or down the hill, heating up to infinite temperature, which happens at rate F squared and independent of Q. Even the uniform system does that. That's what I told you right at the beginning. So there's this mode, the fast mode. And then the slow mode goes, whoops, goes as Q to the fourth. And you, know, you can calculate that. Um, and, and the way this mode works is you've got all this potential energy stored in the pattern due to Q being non-zero, that has to be converted to heat, transported as heat by a heat diffusion, and that's the way it relaxes. Um, and, and so you get this sub-diffusive 
dynamics where something of wavelength lambda relaxes at a rate which goes as the minus fourth power of lambda. And then you see here, it's the energy transport which is coming in here, uh, whereas over here, since you're, so it's sort of everything is swapped, you know, you're just heating the atoms up to infinite temperature, but they're doing that by moving the atoms up and down the hill. So the atom diffusivity is what enters here, whereas the thermal diffusivity is what enters here. Um, even though uh, this mode is mostly the atom density and this mode is purely the energy density. So, so things get swapped because these, these off-diagonal couplings become the dominant term. Um, okay, so it's a, it's a novel uh, dynamical situation, which I hope uh, you find interesting. I certainly found it interesting. Um, so, so, so to summarize, uh, we have this new transport regime, which was discovered in this experiment. So what actually happened in the experiment, it was done for some other reason to look at something related to many body localization. Uh, but the beautiful thing of these cold atom experiments is you can control all the parameters. And so they looked around and uh, found this new regime in the experiment. And the, as theorists, we had to figure out what it was. <laughs> Um, but it was discovered first uh, in the lab because we hadn't anticipated uh, that that would be discovered, but we were actually looking for something else. Um, okay, so it's a temperature near infinity band gas in a tilted potential. Um, particle and energy transport are strongly coupled and it, re it produces this uh, relaxation rate going as wave number to the fourth subdiffusive transport. Um, uh, up and down the hill. There's there's actually normal diffusion across the hill along the y direction. So so it's this anisotropic transport. And as I said, this was discovered and explored in cold atom experiments. Um, and let me just say a, a little bit more about it since I didn't say it. So in this regime, the tilt energy part of the Hamiltonian is the dominant term in the energy. And and what is this? You know, sum of position times density, that's a dipole. So this tilt energy is a force times a dipole. And what's happening is when the tilt is the dominant part of the energy, when F is big enough and the wavelength is long enough, um, energy conservation becomes to first approximation dipole conservation because the dipole is the biggest part of the energy. Um, and so, so this uh, thing, which again was discovered for other reasons, relates to this uh, recently studied uh, fracton models. You know, there's a whole bunch of work that you may be aware of, of people exploring what is dynamics in the presence of a dipole conservation for various reasons. And here's, a, here's one, of the, one paper re uh, discussing that kind of stuff. Um, and so this also connects to uh, these fracton models or models with conserved dipole. Okay, so that's uh, where I'm going to stop. Thank you. Questions, comments? Okay, Abhishek. Uh, yeah, uh, so I had a couple of questions. One is, I mean, I, uh, so this, uh, the, the particle current, I mean, so you have, I, I don't quite understand this extra term that uh, depends on the force. So somehow it looks like the mobility depends on the energy density, right? Oh, it, no, it's not the mobility, right? So, so, so this is the equation for local equilibrium, right? So did, uh, and that, that's what goes into this. So, that, so, so when dn dx is equal to the appropriate number times beta times f, that's local equilibrium and there's nothing driving the atom transport, okay? And now beta is proportional to the energy density because we're near infinite temperature, okay? And I've chosen the energy density to be zero at infinite temperature, that's my definition. Um, and so what this equation here is for the, so this is now the atom current. This is the diffusivity. It's just the diffusivity, it's not density dependent. Um, there's the, again, this typo that was supposed to be dn dx. And this thing in the parentheses is the deviation of the gradient from local equilibrium, right? So if this is zero, that means we're at local equilibrium. There's nothing driving the current and the current is zero, 
But if the gradient, density gradient is a little bit different from what's dictated by the force and the energy density, which is setting the temperature, then that deviation will drive the current, right? You see, you see what I mean, Abhishek? Uh, yes, it's a sort of... Uh... Yeah, it's something we had to figure out. Um, but if you just, you know, you just, you just ask, you know, you know, we actually went back to basics and we calculate, so we're near infinite temperature, so we could just calculate the entropy density as a function of the atom number density and the energy density, because you can do the high temperatures expansion fully systematically. And then you just ask, by moving atoms, can it raise the entropy, right? And if that's true, that will drive a current. Right, that's just basic statistical mechanics, right? The system is trying to increase its entropy, right? We've got conserved energy, conserved atom number. And if it can, by moving atoms or by moving energy, it can raise the entropy, that's the driving force, which will drive it, right? And this thing in the parentheses is telling you is, is uh, you know, if I move atoms up or down the hill, the amount of entropy production is proportional to what's in the parentheses here, right? And again, remember that's dn dx. I have a typo there. And so, so we actually, you know, we were a little, it's, you know, this is different kind of dynamics than we're used to because of, you know, it's unfamiliar. And so we actually, just to make sure we knew what we were doing, we actually just went back to the entropy and, and asked, you know, what are the driving forces that, that will push currents that if the current flows, it increases the entropy. Because that's really all that we're talking about here is going towards higher entropy because it's a closed system, right? Okay, and so this is uh, uh, valid, I mean, not at the initial times, but after the system kind of goes to a local equilibrium state. Is that right? Yeah, not and that's a, that's a fast time. So what? So there's this fast mode which is really going to local equilibrium, okay, okay, okay. right? And that, and that doesn't depend on the wavelength, right? So when we're doing long wavelengths in the experiment, this is order one, right? And then the dynamics is very slow, right? So it, so it, so it very quickly, if it's not at local equilibrium, atoms will slide up or down the hill very quickly, if, you know, unless F is very small, um, and it'll establish local equilibrium quite quickly. Um, and then after that, it does this uh, slow subdiffusive dynamics. Now, when the when the force is small or the wavelength is large, you know, then and you're in the crossover from diffusion to subdiffusion, you know, then it's not so simple, right? And in the experiment, we also explored that crossover somewhat, right? Because you can solve, you know, of course, it's just a little two by two matrix. You can solve for the whole crossover, um, and and the, and the, but that's you know that's that sort of details. That are that are less less interesting. So, you know, yeah. Uh, so if you go to your slide eight, if you want one slide before, yeah, yeah. So I guess what you're saying, if you look at the energy equation here, you the f squared over j squared, the last term at low frequencies, you can kind of ignore the dE over dt and say that e is determined by the rest of this equation. And if you plug that solution into your density equation, what you find is that the normal order wave number squared or order del squared piece cancels and you're left with del fourth. Is that basically what happens? Uh... Right, I mean, if, you, if you look at that last equation and first work to leading order in wave number, to leading order in wave number. Yeah, e right. Oh yeah. Oh, 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 you're talking about the fast. So the fast mode. Yes. The fast mode is, yeah. Ignore these first two terms. And, and then it's just the energy just relaxes. Right. No, no. So what I'm saying is if you treat that That's mode as fast. fast, no, no. What I'm saying yes. is if you treat that mode as fast, then that equation for the fast mode tells you that E is determined on a short time scale by, by dn over dx, right? Yeah, and, right. and that's and so the local you, equilibrium. And if you plug that into the density equation, what happens then is the usual order del squared piece of the relaxation of the density cancels. 
and you're left with the yeah. term that you would normally not worry about at next ordering rate number. Yeah, yeah, the leading term gets canceled because right. of that. Okay. Right. And, then, and then the next term is, yeah, that's another way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. If David, I, I have a question. You know, you, here you are putting the tilt along the x direction, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So what happens if you also put in the y direction? I mean, if you have an I mean, you have an highly anisotropic here. But if we put a tilt, let's say, I mean, I have another but, term okay, so, by J. I mean, how robust yeah, yeah. is this T to the power one fourth uh, sub diffusive growth? That's the question I'm asking. Okay, so as long as the tilt doesn't get too strong, mm -hmm. the system does thermalize and you get this dynamics up and down the hill and then standard diffusion across the hill. And it's not sensitive to whether you're putting it along the lattice directions. Um, but then if you go to higher forces, uh, you start having some strong dependence on these angles. And that's right. the stuff related to localization that was the initial motivation for exploring this, which we never really got great data about. Um, uh, and then they were actually, you know, what, what, what actually happened is they were exploring it actively, but then the uh, pandemic came along and the lab had to huh. close. And while the lab was closed, uh, they thought of all sorts of new things to do with their experiment <laughs> and designed all these new things. And then when they came back, they didn't want to go back to this experiment because they wanted to build all this new stuff, which they had planned out during the pandemic. <laughs> um, so but there, is, they, there is a whole bunch of interesting stuff related to exactly what you asked, uh, which has been explored a little bit. Um, I see. You know, so you know what yeah. yeah and 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 uh, and but but hasn't been explored enough yet to really you know report um but uh, yeah. but it, at weak at weak tilt this story is what counts as you go to strong tilt you you start yeah, getting helpless, into yeah. the localization related stuff yeah. um right. which is right. as as we know from, uh, you know, that's much more complicated and everything slows down. The experiments are very much less straightforward. And um, yeah, so it's a very good question, but I don't have an answer. Manus? Uh, hi, David. Uh, I just had one, uh, so uh, one question. So if, uh, uh, so finally, uh, even if I have some other system, uh, not not just a Fermi Hubbard, but some, some other even bosonic system, Assuming that I'm uh, out away from integrability, even then these things should happen, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I should have said that. You know, of course, the experiment was done with fermions because that's what they had. But the physics we're talking about, um, you know, I never used the fact that they were fermions in any of the discussion, and 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 we certainly believe that if it was bosons and it was non-integrable, uh, it would do essentially the same thing. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Because yeah. you know the difference because because it's at infinite you know it goes to infinite temperature right the differences between fermions and bosons they show up when you get to degeneracy at low temperatures right whereas at infinite temperature you know you don't expect any differences right yeah, yeah. thanks so, there was an online but, question from Christian Mai is that yeah go ahead. Question. Oh, oh, it's on the chat. Should I look at it? Sorry, I had one question. Yeah, Deepak had a question. Yeah, Deepak, please. So uh, you are not considering the time regime where the unitary evolution or the lean blood evolution or some such thing is relevant? Okay, so this is a closed system. So so this is this is just unitary evolution. Okay. Right. But a, 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 a quantum, a many body interacting quantum chaotic system under its unitary time evolution, it is its own bath and it does dissipate of stuff and maximizes its entropy, you know, as a closed system, right? So this is all unitary dynamics. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. So I was, <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, those of you who are more sophisticated would notice that I didn't put the cross terms. Um, the cross terms are non-zero as far as we know. Um, they don't, and there would be Onsager relations, absolutely. Um, you can put them in and 
the equations get a little bit more complicated, uh, but the basic physics um, doesn't change, right? So, so yes, absolutely. There, there is an on there is cross terms where uh, you know gradients in the energy drive uh, particle currents and gradients in the in the number density drive energy currents um, and Onsager relations between them. Those those cross terms uh, and you can put right. You're absolutely right. Um, and I just left that out because I wanted it to be simple. And if I put it in. It wouldn't change the physics in any way other than just adding an extra correction, which is, you know, nothing uh, qualitative, right? So, yeah, th thanks for the question. Okay. Keeping me honest. <laughs> you have a question? Okay, one more question, last. I guess uh, two small questions. Like, do we, does this rely on there being like a Y direction? Because you said there was like sub diffusive transport in the X direction and uh, normal diffusion in the y direction. Could we stylize this as just a one-dimensional system? It relies on it being uh, non-integrable and thermalizing. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if it was, if it, you know, the the one-dimensional Fermi Hubbard model yeah. is integral, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if you really did literally what I'm talking about, it was only one dimensional, you know, you'd have to worry about how's it going to thermalize because it's an integrable system before you put the tilt on. Um, so in that sense, we were using, but, but what's important isn't that it's two dimensional, it's that the system at zero tilt, which we're sort of, ex well, we're not literally expanding or, well, yeah, you know, we want to have a theory which works you know, all the way from substantial tilt down to zero tilt, you know, and gives a full crossover from diffusion to, to this novel new regime. And what we would need is some dynamics such that at zero tilt, it thermalizes and has standard diffusion. Of course, you can do that in one dimensional models uh, if you make sure they're non-integrable, right? So, and, and so that's what's important is that the, the zero tilt model is non-integral. I mean, the question was kind of to one my idea I had was like, can we see this as a particle system? Like, can we actually, in the experiment, can we actually see the atoms hop? From well, not from potential to potential. They don't, they, they can only take, so, the, so the, the imaging is destructive. So, you know, it is a particle system. They see the individual atoms, but they can't take movies, right? So they run the experiment so they can reproduce the initial conditions quite faithfully run the experiment for a certain amount of time and then take a picture. Um, and then you make the movies out of, out of uh, many pictures taken at different times, right? So in that sense, you don't see the particles hop. Um, that's, that's you know, because the, the imaging is destructive. You know, basically when you wanna take a picture, you just, turn the optical lattice up super strong so the atoms can't hop anymore and you just freeze them in position and then you image them. And then the imaging totally heats the system up. Do you have ideas about the underlying di dynamics of how, how they're hopping? Oh, it's, it's just this, it's just Hubbard model. Okay. They tunnel through the barriers, right? So there's two scales, right? They're tunneling through this barrier from, from, uh, you know, from this low energy state to this low, this low energy state in this well to this low energy state in this well. Um, and, and it's just, it's a tunneling process. Um, and that gives this uh, hopping term in the, in the, uh, in the Hubbard Hamiltonian or just, you know, a tight binding type hopping term. That's, that's really all it is. I don't know that there's much more you can say than that. Um, you know, and it is just a single particle problem. So that's something you can solve in whatever detail you want um, numerically. Okay, so if there is no other question, let's uh, thank David. Uh, thank you, David, for joining us. Uh, and thanks also to Shobo for, for this uh, two.